Welcome to session six of our course. Um, the topic of this session is alliances and joint ventures. And let's get started. Um, one of the first, first things I want to talk about is some of the differences between mergers and alliance, mergers and acquisitions and alliances. Uh, we'll be talking more about M&A next week. Um, but first, I want to offer a little clarification. Uh, sometimes it's easy to think of alliances and M&A uh, as something that's just a difference in degree. Uh, in both cases, you're accessing external resources, and the main difference is how much of that resource that you own, uh, especially with joint ventures, um, including an equity stake in a new entity. Um, but there are a number of differences that I just want to highlight quickly here. Uh, the first is in terms of partner and target selection. Uh, with mergers and acquisitions, that's a one-time decision and a binary choice of buying or not buying. Uh, and once you've bought that company, obviously it's uh, going to be integrated and things like that. Uh, so the decision to divest that is pretty complicated. Uh, on the other hand, an alliance is something that is more of a continuous decision and an ongoing decision. Uh, the, with any alliance, you can choose to continue it at the same level of involvement. Uh, you could scale it up, you could scale it down, and you can also exit it. And um, this ongoing choice is one of the unique features of alliances, uh, creates a lot of flexibility. Uh, the next is about uh, the types of uh, due diligence that is done. Uh, with M&A, financials are generally used to justify the price. Uh, it's a lot of investment and a lot of risk. Uh, so you need to be very sure about uh, the synergies that are going to be created and exactly how much those synergies are worth uh, so that you can figure out a fair price. With uh, alliances, it's a little different. Uh, you're more thinking about the competitive landscape, uh, about culture fit. Uh, collaboration is key, and especially if you want a successful long-term relationship, uh, you need to know that uh, there's room for collaboration there over the long term. Uh, you need to have some understanding of what their goals are and uh, ensuring that they don't conflict with your goals. Uh, some of the uh, differences are also in valuation and negotiation. Uh, with mergers and acquisitions, a purchase price is negotiated up front. Uh, we'll go into a little bit more detail on that uh, in our next session, uh, but uh, the buyer needs to be very certain of the uh, synergies to be created because they're paying up front for those, and uh, the expected gains are distributed based on that. Uh, with alliances, the distribution of gain, gains can change over the life of the alliance. Uh, it can also continue to evolve uh, based on decisions about how well uh, value is being created, determining whether additional value can be created by scaling up, uh, maybe uh, scaling back to eliminate some cooperation that isn't creating a lot of value. Uh, so that makes alliances much less uh, risky to enter into compared to mergers and acquisitions and changes uh, the timing of when you need to know uh, pretty concretely how much value is going to be created. Uh, in terms of implementation, uh, not surprisingly, given uh, what we learned in session two, uh, but with mergers and acquisitions, one-sided synergies are relatively easy. Um, also, more resource modification is more easy to manage within an M&A uh, uh, situation. Uh, that's because resources are being brought internal and um, that can align incentives. Uh, One-sided synergies with an alliance are much more difficult. Uh, the side that's incurring a cost but not really realizing the benefit uh, really needs to be incentivized in order to do that. And that can be difficult to negotiate. Um, with M&A, there's also a trade-off between uh, the collaboration and disruption caused by post-merger integration, and there are various approaches to minimizing that and getting the most value out of that. Um, and also, capabilities are, uh, being transferred is a very explicit goal. Um, when you're doing an acquisition, you are literally buying everything that that company has, uh, so uh, there's nothing secret about that. Uh, with alliances, there's often a trade-off between collaboration and competition. Um, 
because knowledge is so commonly shared in alliances and joint ventures, uh, each firm needs to be sure that they're protecting the knowledge that they need to protect, uh, only sharing that knowledge that they need to share to create value and ensuring that they're uh, protected against the loss of any of the resources that they're sharing. Uh, in that case, capability transfer can often be a hidden goal. Um, it's not necessarily a complete secret that firms want to learn from each other, um, but it's often less uh, spoken about as a go goal. Um, with, in terms of evaluation, um, with M&A, uh, the ownership is ongoing by default, and the divestiture's decision would be made uh, pretty much independently of that. Uh, with an alliance, uh, evaluation is much more um, negotiated and there may be terms or times uh, agreed to in advance when both sides will come back together and decide whether or not to continue the relationship or modify the relationship. Uh, so those are some of the qualitative differences between M&A and alliances. Um, and I'll continue talking about alliances and joint ventures uh, here with the uh, resource pathways framework. Uh, by now you should all be pretty familiar with uh, this resource pathways framework. As discussed previously, uh, you begin this framework by identifying a strategic resource gap. That requires having some awareness and decision about what your strategy is and a recognition of what resources are necessary for that strategy that you don't already have access to. Uh, in our previous session, we talked about internal development uh, based on uh, knowledge fit and organizational fit for building a resource internally. If building that resource internally is not an option, uh, the next step is considering uh, borrowing via contract. The overarching issue for borrowing via contract is resource tradability. Um, as with uh, as with building internally, uh, there's a knowledge question and a governance question uh, to help identify resource tradability. Uh, the first is high resource clarity. Uh, if you are uh, writing a contract, you need to be very clear and explicit about the obligations of each side and what's being provided and the responsibilities. Um, that requires some clarity about the resource being shared. Uh, if it's something more creative, uh, for example, it could be difficult to define um, exactly what the output is. Uh, it's hard to say that uh, this idea that's been created is a good idea versus a bad idea, for example. Um, so resource clarity is very important. Um, it's relatively easy with uh, specific patents or uh, trademarks or things like that, uh, physical resources. Uh, in terms of governance, resource protection is very important. Uh, so any of the resources that are being shared uh, with some other uh, partner through a contract uh, must be protected. Uh, again, that's often easier with more clearly definable uh, resources being shared. Uh, so you have intellectual property laws or real property laws. Uh, with something like knowledge, that's much more difficult to protect. Uh, especially if it's knowledge that is uh, valuable to everybody that owns it. Uh, but once your partner has gained that knowledge, they may no longer need you. Uh, so resource protection is also important. Uh, if you have high resource clarity and high re resource protection, uh, contracting or licensing can be a good choice. Uh, if you don't have one or either of those, um, then a contract is probably not optimal and you need to consider an alliance. Um, in terms of borrowing via an alliance, uh, the overarching issue there is the desired closeness with your resource partner. Um, this, this issue often confuses people uh, because the previous pathway is borrowing via a contract. Uh, you might assume that uh, desired closeness is high for an alliance. Uh, but if you've eliminated the contract option or pathway, you're really comparing uh, an alliance versus a merger or acquisition. The reason that desired closeness is uh, low with an alliance is that um, essentially you're talking about interdependence between the firms, uh, joint operation between the firms. Uh, the more 
dimensions of cooperation that exist, uh, the more synergies that are being created and the more each side needs to interact with the other, the more difficult that relationship becomes to manage. Um, this kind of goes to the idea of modularity that we've spoken about in previous sessions uh, and we'll talk about again in our next session, uh, but having uh, relative uh, independence between the business units and restricting uh, interdependence to a manageable level that makes the relationship much easier to manage uh, and can ensure that both sides have flexibility and can understand uh, how their decisions will affect their partner and vice versa. Uh, the governance question for borrowing be an alliance is compatible partner goals. Uh, sometimes that may involve having a shared goal. Uh, if you are doing uh, research and development together on a new product, for example. Uh, your goal is to create a quality new product. Uh, if you have a joint venture and you're both investing in that, uh, the goal is for that joint venture to be successful so that uh, both sides profit from that. Um, so if you have these, uh, oh, in addition to um, sharing the same goal, uh, it's also very possible that the partner goals will not be the same. Um, Often what each side needs, needs is different than what the other side needs. Uh, but as long as those goals are not conflicting with each other, uh, you can still create a lot of value. Um, in terms of compatible partner goals, uh, again, knowledge sharing, uh, maybe an example where there is conflict. Uh, so you don't wanna share uh, knowledge resources that uh, would put you at a disadvantage once that knowledge is out there. Uh, One-sided synergies could also be a marker of incompatible partner goals. Um, and if you don't have uh, this narrow collaboration scope or compatible partner goals, then um, that pathway is eliminated and you move on to an acquisition pathway, which we'll discuss next week. Uh, next, I wanna talk a little bit about the value of alliance uh, partners and these relationships. Uh, to do that, I want to contrast with a couple other views. Uh, you are probably familiar with Porter's Five Forces. Uh, that is a big part of the industry analysis view. The question asked by that framework is why some industries are more profitable than others, and that's based on industry characteristics, uh, like barriers to entry, threats of substitutes, and so on. Uh, with the resource-based view, the question shifts from industries to the firm level and asks why some uh, firms are more profitable than others based on the characteristics of the firm uh, resources that they have. Um, that brings us to the relational view. Uh, the relational view is still uh, thinking about the advantage of firms and why they might be more profitable, but it's based on firm relationships. A uh, key distinction between that and the resource-based view is that a relationship is not a resource that exists within one firm or another firm. Uh, the value re resides in that relationship between firms. Uh, so it's very important for both sides to be involved in creating value uh, through relational advantage. Uh, there are several uh, determinants of relational advantage. Uh, these are characteristics of strong relationships and ways in which uh, strong relationships create value. Uh, the first is the creation of relation-specific assets. Uh, these are um, investments that allow both sides to create more value together. Uh, a number of these uh, can be characterized by uh, the various types of uh, relation-specific assets described by Oliver Williamson. Uh, for example, you might have site specificity, where you co-locate uh, different parts of the produ production value chain. Uh, so inputs and outputs being located next to each other uh, to improve coordination and reduce costs. Um, having a long contract is something that could justify that. Uh, similarly, a volume of interactions uh, between the firms over a long period of time can create trust for that. Um, other uh, relation-specific assets can include physical asset specificity, uh, so investing in idiosyncratic uh, capital requirements or modifying your processes to be uniquely valuable when working together. 
Uh, human asset specificity uh, involves the know-how or tacit knowledge that's accumulated over the long relationship working together. Um, so all of these are ways that value is created and um, specifically having these relation specific assets as part of a, um, an ongoing relationship is an indicator that some of the uh, value being created through idiosyncratic investment uh, can be created uh, between firms as opposed to within a single firm. Uh, so you're creating the synergy or the value uh, without uh, needing to incur ownership costs, uh, which is why it's an advantage over the competition. Uh, next is knowledge sharing routines. Um, again, valuable relationships are characterized by these routines. Um, these routines allow for a regular pattern of interaction, allowing uh, the firms to transfer, recombine, and create specialized knowledge that is valuable uh, to either one or the other or to both sides of the relationship. Uh, tacit knowledge in particular can be valuable uh, when transferred or recombined. But uh, if you're sharing tacit knowledge, you really want to know that you can uh, trust your counterpart and that they're not going to take advantage of you uh, once they've learned what they need to learn. Um, as with the relation-specific assets, a uh, long history of working together, uh, particularly with overlapping knowledge bases, can be very useful here. Um, one of these facilitating sub-processes is partner-specific absorptive capacity. Uh, essentially, that means uh, that <coughs> by virtue of working together, you've uh, developed an understanding of your partner, of the resources that they have, uh, the context that they're operating in, and that allows both sides to um, incorporate knowledge from the other and communicate more effectively. Uh, if you have particularly unique needs and you're trying to explain those to your partner, uh, the more you've worked together, that easier that is to understand for them. Um, part of this knowledge can also uh, um, include knowing where resources lie within your partner. Uh, so if problems come up, it can be very valuable to know exactly who you need to call in the partner company in order to resolve that. Um, here again, incentives need to be aligned. Uh, that can be done through formal mechanisms or informal mechanisms. Uh, but you really need to encourage uh, transparency and discourage free riding. And we'll talk a little bit more about those uh, governance mechanisms uh, in a couple slides. Uh, the next uh, determinant or characteristic of relational advantage is complementary resources and capabilities. Um, this is essentially equivalent to uh, the uh, resource-based synergy is being created uh, either between firms or within firms. Um, a big part of that is being able to actually identify what those complementarities are and how the resources of both sides can be combined to create unique value. Uh, so again, having a long history of working together and a lot of trust between you makes that much easier to accomplish. Um, frequency of transactions also helps. Um, Another thing that can develop is organizational complementarity. Uh, so it's possible that uh, the resources of two companies will co-evolve over time uh, so that each firm is able to specialize more in what it's good at and underinvest in the areas where its partner is uh, more capable. Uh, that can increase uh, the dependence between the partners over time, uh, but it can create a lot of value there. I think the Disney and Pixar case that we discussed earlier uh, in this term is an example of that. Um, Pixar, by not having to spend money on distribution and merchandising and theme parks, could focus on what they were really good at, which was creating uh, the tools and technology and the team uh, to make great uh, digital animation. Uh, Disney uh, had invested a lot of money trying to make uh, successful digital animation. Uh, they were not doing well with that. So once they created this partnership with Pixar, they could continue to focus on what they were really good at mm -hmm. while investing less in those things that they were uh, less good at. Um, over time, that made them very interdependent. And uh, of course, uh, 
Disney acquired Pixar down the road. Uh, so clearly that was an example of a lot of value being created. Uh, the last thing um, I wanted to talk about in terms of effective and valuable relations uh, or relationships that create relational advantage is effective governance. Um, in particular, uh, creating self-enforcing agreements between the firms is a way to align incentives and encourage cooperation. Uh, a lot of these might be formal uh, self-governing mechanisms uh, or self-enforcing governance mechanisms. Um, examples of that can include uh, equity investments in the partner. Uh, this is less common in the U.S., but outside the U.S., there are a lot of uh, contexts where uh, suppliers and producers might uh, have equity stakes in each other to align their incentives. Uh, so if one does well, you do well uh, also. Um, joint ventures are another example of aligning incentives and creating a self-enforcing agreement because both sides have put valuable resources into the joint venture. They both want to see a payback from that and they want to see that joint venture do well. Um, symmetric timing of, of investments is a third example of a formal uh, self-enforcing governance mechanism. Uh, if two sides don't trust each other, but are hoping to create value through uh, idiosyncratic investments made by both sides, timing those investments to coincide uh, allows uh, the investment to be made without either side being more exposed and more at risk than the other. Uh, but all of these are not necessarily the lowest cost way of uh, creating resources. Uh, that means that if informal mechanisms can be used, uh, that can uh, lower the cost of creating some of this value. Uh, again, informal self-enforcing mechanisms uh, that I've talked about earlier include things like uh, trust and norms of reciprocity. If we've worked together for many years and have never taken advantage of each other, uh, that allows us to uh, time our investment decisions for when they make the most sense as opposed to forcing them to take place at the same time. Uh, it could even be possible that I need something from you right now, but you don't need anything from me. Um, perhaps my needs have changed in some way. Um, given our long relationship, you're likely to accommodate that change and help me out, knowing that if the situation reverses in the future, um, I'll do the same in return. Uh, in terms of sustainability of relational advantage, uh, not surprisingly, any sort of uh, advantage in strategy is worth sustaining if possible. Uh, a lot of these um, facilitating mechanisms are very similar to previous concepts uh, that you've been exposed to. Uh, having uh, resources that are valuable, rare, inimitable, and non-substitutable, all are uh, things that help create value. Um, just quickly, uh, a valuable resource is a resource that uh, can be used to increase willingness to pay. Uh, that resource being rare allows you to capture some of that value being created uh, as opposed to uh, customers receiving all of that value due to perfect competition. Um, resources that are inimitable are difficult to copy or slow to copy, and that can help sustain uh, the value of resources. Uh, finally, non-substitutable non is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, if your resource is able to create willingness to pay that cannot be created by any substitute, uh, that's a good thing for sustainable advantage. Uh, in terms of um, these resources in the context of relationships, uh, if each side has uh, resources characterized by this and they're able to bring them together in a unique combination, uh, that can create a resource that's even more valuable, even more rare, and also even more inimitable. Uh, some things that can um, continue uh, to sustain this resource advantage um, in the relationship is causal ambiguity. Uh, we talked about that a little bit in terms of copying um, previously, but causal ambiguity can also apply to successful relationships. Uh, it's very difficult to observe from the outside uh, everything that's necessary for 
uh, a successful relationship to work. Uh, so even if your competitors can see that you have a very valuable relationship with one supplier, uh, they won't necessarily be able to go out and create an identical relationship. Um, even if they somehow could figure out every single step you took along the way, uh, their culture and uh, setup and resources are going to be at least somewhat different from yours. Uh, so uh, that limits imitation. Um, I talked a lot in the previous slide uh, or the previous several slides about um, trust and that being built up over a long period of time and a lot of transactions that creates time compression dis economies. Uh, if you're trying to create a very strong relationship and you know that that will be valuable, uh, it's still difficult to quickly create that. Uh, it's very hard to quickly build up trust with a partner that you haven't worked with before. Uh, so that makes uh, any relational advantage uh, more sustainable. Uh, finally, there are uh, Intra-organizational asset stock interconnectedness. Um, essentially, that's saying that prior investments in the relationship or between the partners facilitate additional and ongoing uh, investments by both sides. Um, part of that is through the enablement of trust. Uh, it's also able to uh, grow the base of resources that both sides are working together on. Uh, so all of that can really help. Um, I'll leave that there. Uh, two factors are a little bit more unique to the relational view. One is partner scarcity. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, there may be a clearly visible relationship that other competitors would like to copy. But uh, even if they were exactly identical to you in every way, they would also have to find a partner identical to your partner in order for them to try to create the exact same uh, relational advantage. Um, because complementarity uh, between any two pairs of companies is going to vary substantially. Uh, trying to imitate a valuable relationship can be difficult. Uh, another thing that's specific to this is the resource indivisibility. Uh, again, we talked earlier about Disney and Pixar, uh, each specializing their investments in their own areas of expertise, uh, making them increasingly dependent on each other. Uh, the the longer that they do that, the more dependent they come <coughs> on each other, and the harder it would be for any other partner to try to uh, come in and create the same value. Uh, so uh, it is important to know that this growing interdependence can uh, reduce flexibility. So you do want to think about that when uh, entering into a relationship and growing a relationship. Um, but again, this helps facilitate uh, value creation in the relationship and making that relational advantage sustainable. Uh, finally, um, I wanna talk a little bit about the knowledge-based view and joint venturing. Um, a joint venture is taking uh, some sort of partnership between companies and they uh, create a new legal entity that they each have an ownership and control stake in. Um, it's not just a more intensive uh, alliance or partnership. It's also not the same as a merger. Uh, so each of the companies remains an independent company and they've created a new company um, that they each have the stake in. And the purpose of joint venturing uh, especially revolves around uh, knowledge, firm knowledge, and tacit knowledge in particular. Uh, as mentioned in a uh, previous section, uh, or session rather, uh, Tacit knowledge is very difficult to copy, um, so that protects uh, the advantage uh, that you have from tacit knowledge. Unfortunately, tacit knowledge is also difficult to share and transmit, even when you're hoping to do that, uh, because it often requires uh, experience, working side by side, uh, learning from doing. Uh, it's difficult to transmit uh, between companies and often even within your company uh, if you're trying to grow quickly. So uh, the joint venture allows uh, both sides of a partnership to uh, move their own resources and people into this joint venture. And these people can work side by side with each other. Uh, they can learn from each other uh, by working together. They can uh, develop tacit knowledge that combines both of their knowledge bases. Uh, so 
Uh, this joint venture allows that sharing of uh, knowledge in a very valuable way, uh, but it also retains an ownership and control stake over it. Um, of course, that's not complete control or ownership. Um, if one side had that, then the other side would not have a lot of incentive to put their uh, tacit knowledge into that. Uh, but because it's a jointly owned venture, um, neither side can do something with that knowledge that would uh, disadvantage the other. Uh, often the sharing is bi-directional, so you're mixing tacit knowledge from multiple companies together. Uh, it's very common. Uh, knowledge itself is valuable, and when uh, bases of knowledge from different sources are combined, often you can create even more value. Uh, it could also be unidirectional, so in some cases you might be combining uh, specialized talent uh, with, with tacit knowledge with some other type of resources, uh, perhaps some patents or trademarks or other resources that um, can be combined with that tacit knowledge in a uniquely valuable way. And uh, again, by having it in this joint venture, it encourages the sharing of uh, that valuable knowledge and those other valuable resources in a way that um, gives some um, control and some ownership to both sides uh, so that they can have their incentives aligned and uh, encourages the success of that. So that is all for alliances and joint ventures. I look forward to seeing you all in class uh, for our next class uh, when we talk about mergers and acquisitions. Thank you.